please go ahead, uh, Mr. Di Matteo. Good afternoon uh, and good morning and good evening, everyone. I'm Giovanni Di Matteo from the Italian Council for Agricultural Research and Economics, and I'm going to talk about my presentation uh, with the title Mapping Soil Biodiversity Research, a Network Analysis Approach. So, okay. Okay, so soil biodiversity research is a very important research topic because it is showing uh, strong correlations with uh, multidisciplinary and multifunctional research. So it may be possible an increase of soil biodiversity research in the last year, and as could be recorded in scientific databases such as uh, um, Scopus Elsevier, Web of Science, Google Scholar, and so on. So under such circumstances, science mapping or a network analysis and a, uh, mapping could be a useful tool to show the dynamic aspects of a particular research field because it may highlight its inter uh, intra connection about, among them. So also in the past, this approach has been applied to several research fields like biodiversity, remote sensing, climate engineering, renewable energy, precision agriculture, and so on. So um, this, this study has two uh, main specific objectives. And the first one is to represent the soil biodiversity research field in terms of the most commonly occurring research terms and how they are interrelated. So the second specific object is to represent this topic in terms of co-citated papers. Uh, that is in terms of the impact of this research term um, in the scientific community. In general, the study uh, rationale is to perform a science mapping approach as an explanatory analysis in soil biodiversity research to get its overall overview in terms of published research and uh, topic investigated. So regarding the methodology, I used two, diff two general keywords uh, that is soil biodiversity and soil diversity keyword in the Elsevier Scopus database. And at, at the final of the searching criteria, I retrieved 813 papers in the time slice 1983-2020. So uh, here I'm showing three nice examples of the searching criteria, where, which uh, uh, the, the two uh, general keywords are present in the first case, in the title, uh, in the abstract of our specific papers in the second case uh, in the abstract, in the third case in the keywords of the specific papers. So then uh, a specific software named Voz Viewer uh, that is visualization of similarities freely available, available in the Voz Viewer uh, website. Uh, has been used to clustering research term and consequently producing two different types of maps, the concurrence term map and the co-sided term maps. The first, the concurrence term map was characterized by two different types of clusterization. So the first type is uh, um, related to the term frequencies. The bigger is the circle of specific research term, the higher is its term frequencies. The second clusterization uh, um, was considering the distance among, uh, um, among the uh, research term. And so, when a term frequently co-occurs with each other is located in the same cluster. This is the overall uh, overview of the uh, first clusterization of the first map. The second map, uh, uh, the analysis uh, produced is the co-sited term map, uh, where the impact of a specific research term is shown. Here, the analysis show a score range ranging from blue color, means lower 
citation impact from red color uh, means higher citation impact. So the analysis to avoid bias related to the age of a publication um, divided the average number of all citation of a all publication appearing in the same year. This produced a publication normali normalized score ranging from zero to two. So, however, for more methodological information on this analysis, please see the uh, specific uh, publication published in 2010 from Van Eck and Waltman in Scientometric Journal. So this is the first results and the figure show uh, the trend of annual published paper in soil biodiversity subject. The trend increased since 2012 and peaking in 2019 with more than 100 papers. So these results highlight an increasing attention from the scientific community regarding this topic, especially in the last uh, 10 years. So this is the first map elaborated by the analysis and uh, uh, this map can be considered the overall structure of the research topic in soil biodiversity subject, which uh, four uh, dedicated clusters are identified. Each cluster was characterized by a different color and uh, um, moreover, uh, I found several intra uh, interconnection among cluster and within a cluster. So, um, so the blue cluster um, grouped a research term related to soil biogenesis diversity. The red cluster was characterized by research in agricultural productivity. Fuchsia cluster uh, was uh, characterized by research uh, in uh, nutrients and fertilization. And so green uh, yellow cluster um, can be considered on one cluster because green uh, yellow cluster is a subcluster of the green cluster, mainly related to uh, research uh, of micro and macro fauna. So these are the second, the co-sided, um, the co-sided uh, term map uh, showed several highly co-sided term, research term in red, uh, evenly distributed across the cluster and some, some uh, significant examples in the right part of the side of the map our food security research term, emission, uh, conservation agriculture, service in the bottom side of the map, nitrogen fertilization, fertilizer, rotations, cycling, and in the uh, research term, such as terrestrial ecosystem, biodiversity loss, uh, sp spatial scale. So, um, they are uh, several uh, research, uh, co-sided research term, mean a highly impact of this uh, research term in the scientific community. So mm -hmm. concluding, uh, concluding um, the analysis show three main conclusions. The first is that the number of paper, papers in soil biodiversity research increased exponentially since 2012 among the English language literature. So uh, they represent by uh, four cluster uh, in relation to soil pathogenesis diversity, agricultural productivity, nutrients and fertilization and micro and macro fauna uh, research. So also, uh, the analysis cited uh, a research term, more general and in that in other cases more specific, specific, specific in relation to conservation agriculture, uh, food security, soil microbial community, terrestrial ecosystems and global change and so on. So uh, in the final, I sh should to know that some methodology improvements uh, related to the arbitrary keywords choice of the primary search and also for the presence of synonyms and homonyms in the searching 
criteria. Uh, in, the, in this case, the first, uh, the presence of the the arbitrary keywords is possible papers. And the second, uh, they could be present in the same cluster or in different clusters. Leading to a possible distortion of the maps. So, also, uh, they are associarelli and Ulderico Neri. And so, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. We lost you a bit, like uh, time by time, because the sound was the sound was cracking. But I think uh, it's okay because we are we seeing the things also, also on the slide. So it was nice to thank you again. It was nice to see where we stand in soil soil biodiversity research. I will uh, could, uh, asking asking presenters to look at the chat time by time to see if there are any questions, like address them. Um, I would like to go to the second presentation directly. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Ms. Camille Imbert uh, from INRA, uh, France. The title is A Soil Biodiversity Survey Coupled with the National Soil Quality Monitoring Network. Ms. Imbert, the floor, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear me properly? Perfect. Okay, I share my screen. Okay, let's go. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Camille Imbert. I work at the INRAE InfoSol in Orléans, France. And today I would like to introduce you a new project that we have that is called the RMQS Biodiversity. And I would like to answer with you to a question, is it possible to add a soil biodiversity, soil biodiversity survey to the French National Soil Quality Monitoring Network. So, so as we already said and we saw, we know, um, we, we see that there is a considerable gap of knowledge in soil bio, biodiversity. We know a little, but we know not enough. In agricultural studies and particularly in agroecology, we need um, very often to focus on soil biodiversity. And we are faced to an observation. We don't know the species that are present in the area that we study. We study, we don't know the distribution areas and we don't know their habitats. So we need large scale soil biodiversity monitorings. In France, we have the French National Soil Quality Network that is called in French, the, the RMQS. It is a pedological survey and it is uh, composed of 2,240 uh, 2, sites that are spread almost on all the French territory according a grid of 16 kilometers per 16 kilometer. The site can be of different land uses like uh, agricultural areas, uh, orchards, pastures, forests, grasslands, gardens also. And each site is a sample each 15 years. And so we start the first campaign in 2000, and right now we are in the second campaign, sampling campaign. So we can say that there is advantages to add a soil biodiversity monitoring to the RNQS because it is spread in the whole continental France and overseas territories, like French Guiana, West Indies, Reunion, and Maya Thailands. The, the teams on the field are already operational. And after, when we will have the biodiversity data, we will be able to link them to the data from the RMQS. So data on soil physical chemical characteristics, on contaminants, on agricultural and soil management practices, and also with the biodiversity data we have already have, and like this to see the temporal um, evolution of biodiversity. So the question is, can we add a soil biodiversity monitoring to the RMQS? So to ask to this question, that is at first a request from the French Biodiversity Agency. We uh, gathered 
um, a group of experts on soil biodiversity from microorganisms to microfauna and also on uh, soil functions. And with them, we wrote a survey to know uh, which sample design use, which taxa to follow, and what are the costs of all this. And the same expert uh, answer to this um, to this survey like this we gather information and we complete them them uh, by interviews and validate them with uh, plenary meetings. So can we add the soil biodiversity monitoring to the arrangements? That means is the sampling frequency every fifteen years is okay for a soil biodiversity monitoring? If the so sampling seasonality that that means um, to sample all the year, except when the soil is too wet or too dry, the, bio, the biodiversity is okay So for, to sample the biodiversity. And if the grid size of six, 16 kilometer per 16 kilometer is okay. According to uh, the answers of the, of the survey, we can say, yes, we can. We can do the RMQS biodiversity. That means to sample biodiversity every 16 kilometer, every 15 years on the same site, and any time during the year when only the only constraints is when the soil is not too dry and not too wet. So we chose five protocols on the field to monitor both taxa and functions. The first one is a surface soil composite sample, but actually is already done in the RMQS, but allows to, uh, to uh, follow the microorganism like bacteria, fungi, protists, and nematodes. Also, the cell soil seed bank, so we have a measure a measurement of the flora like this, and also two uh, soil functions: the enzymatic activity and the organic matter degradation. The second one, the second one is a cylindrical split corer of five uh, centimeters diameter that allow to follow the background mesofauna like uh, springtails, mites, uh, etc. There is another type of uh, core of 16 uh, centimeter diameter, so a little bigger, that uh, allow to follow, to assess the soil porosity due to uh, the microfauna, actually the, the, the air forms uh, tunnels. This, uh, this core is scanned to, um, to show this, uh, this tunnel. We have also the pitfall traps to uh, assess the surface macro and mesofauna, like carabids, spiders, but also springtails. And the last one is uh, the hand sorting of the soil block of a soil block and the spread of a mustard solution to um, follow the the, the below-ground uh, microfauna like earthworms and uh, the rest of the microfauna, mainly larvae. So when you look at also the, the taxa we we will follow, we go from the microorganisms to the microfauna, uh, below ground and above ground. So we can say it's almost a complete soil biodiversity monitoring according to the taxa. And we follow also uh, three functions, the enzymatic activity, the organic matter degradation, and the soil porosity due to microfauna. So the next step of this project is to, um, to test all this on the field. We have to to uh, succeed in uh, limiting uh, the disturbance of the biodiversity that is very sensitive, like, uh, for example, uh, very sensitive to the tram trampling, and also to succeed in doing all the protocols from the RMQS and for the RMQS biodiversity the same day. So we we think about temporal sequence and a special arrangement of the protocols to limit the disturbances. And right now we are testing on the field and we are testing also the, the feasibility, how many it costs, how many people we have to uh, add on the field to do these surveys. And like this, at the end, we will have a first proof of the RMQS biodiversity manual to, uh, to just explain how to uh, do all these protocols on the field. And a first uh, and a proposition to uh, that we will uh, give to the, um, the French uh, biodiversity agency that will after uh, decide if we uh, do uh, by a perennial way uh, the RMQ 
the Aramcus biodiversity uh, on the whole of French territory. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Simba. It was like perfect, perfectly 10 minutes. Uh, this has been a, a nice presentation, clean and clear. Uh, GSP, as GSP also we are working with countries and trying to help them to establish their national soil information and soil monitoring system. And soil biodiversity is, 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 has, has always been a question mark. And what we are expecting from the symposium is answering uh, some of those questions. It's, uh, it's a good start, I think that, uh, and the, Tomorrow we will be we'll be discussing discussing more of this. So I would like to go to the next presentation. Um, I would like to invite Mr. David Russell from Sankenberg Museum of Natural History, Görlitz, Germany, and the the study titled "EU DAFO Base European Biology Data Warehouse for Soil Pro uh, Protection." Please, floor, floor is yours, Mr. Russell. Thank you very much also for this opportunity today. Today, I would like to report to you all in brief, of course, um, of the activities of a European consortium that is developing a data warehouse for soil biodiversity across Europe. Now, the main goal is to establish the scientific databases that is needed for informing policy on maintaining and protecting soil biodiversity. It was mentioned on Monday and today by Alberto that a common argument is that we do not know enough about soil biodiversity. Now, of course, this is not true, but what is true is that our knowledge and especially the data is very scattered, spread among individual studies. So to know more than general principles, the goal of this consortium is to collect and to integrate all of the available data and knowledge throughout um, Europe. Oh, excuse me, I realize here, I had two things on my screen. You can see my presentation, yes? Yes. Okay, because it's showing me something different on my screen here. Okay, um, yes, and uh, we don't really need to talk about the needs for policy, but in detail, since we all know this, but just as a brief example, here are some of the European directives that call for protecting and monitoring and improving soil, soil quality, soil biodiversity, including the ecosystem services that they provide. Um, many of these directives call for monitoring and a few of them also um, explicitly state the need for databases. Now, talking to many policy members or people will say, um, they're almost all explicitly say we need um, uh, for the local level, but at broad scales, um, information on the baselines, thresholds of soil biodiversity, especially information about the drivers of their occurrence, um, as well as their changes and losses. Now, all of these have to be derived from scientific data. Oops. And that is um, the goal of the European Consortium, which is presently organized in a EU cost action in Horizon 2020 um, called EU DAFO base. Currently, uh, oh, more than 100 participants from over 30 um, uh, countries. And the idea is to collate all of our data to be able to establish what do we know about soil biodiversity and ecological correlates, as well as um, be able to use this information to assess the current state as well as its changes. This is using a data platform called Adafobase, which was started in Germany with uh, many German partners a few years ago. And all databases are structured according to their goals, specifically how the data in this database is to be reused. And so the goals of the consortium are to, um, of course, data management for research as well as monitoring programs, to use this data to map current distributions or to model and predict um, um, probable or future distributions, but also to look at specific taxa, their ecological correlates, their niche space, and to use all of this for soil biodiversity assessments, as well as predictions. We begin this, of course, always by looking at the observation data of soil biodiversity in the field. 
The idea is linking this with the spatial data of the sites of occurrence, we can then observe distribution patterns. Linking the observation data with, uh, say, the environmental metadata of the habitats of occurrence, we can be looking at the niche space of specific and general taxa. Combining all three, then it is possible to look at the environmental and anthropogenic controls of soil biodiversity patterns in their distribution, as well as to predict um, potential and future distributions. An explicit goal of the consortium is to include traits in the broadest sense, to connect these with the species, to be able to group the species observational data into functional groups. By including external data, then it is possible to look at the effects of soil biodiversity on ecosystem services. So the idea of this data warehouse is to combine all of these different aspects into one data warehouse and throughout all soil organism groups. Many databases are restricted to a specific soil organism groups. And the idea of EU DAFO base and EDAFO base in general is to combine all soil organism groups together. To do this is difficult in a classical data repository. For this, we need a data warehouse that can integrate heterogeneous data that is collected at various sites from multiple sources at different um, acquisition dates. Um, and then to structure all of these different data sets in a homogeneous manner so that together it can be queried and analyzed. And of course, in a sustainable manner. The consortium is using, as I mentioned, the uh, adafo based platform, which since its initial conception was based upon the FAIR principles. It is open access, it is readily available by using international standards. Um, it is not only internally interoperable, it is also interoperable with other data uh, bases. And most importantly, the data is structured that it, so that it can be reused together. The cost action in this consortium itself is divided into different um, working groups, which are organized all around the idea of connecting that which data providers could offer, as well as what they need, with the needs of data users. For instance, um, standardizing the nomenclatures of vocabularies they were using across Europe in a consensus is important. Um, harmonizing all of the data and the metadata that is coming from these diverse sources. Very important are quality control procedures. So all of this data that's being used is of the highest possible scientific quality. Um, the main goal is to collect, of course, data um, throughout Europe, but not only from individual researchers and institutions, but also to link national databases into a common platform in a form of metadata base. And data policy is an important aspects in this regard because there's the need to balance, let's say, the contradictory requirements between open access data, but also protecting the intellectual property rights of data providers. Now, uploading data to a data warehouse is more difficult than just um, sending an Excel file to a data repository. So software tools are necessary um, to ease this measure. Uh, these are fairly well advanced already. Um, that are also can provide some initial quality control as well as integrate the data into the general database. Um, I mentioned also traits, harmonizing and hierarchizing um, vocabulary, structuring it well. An important aspect is to link the different trait databases for soil biodiversity across Europe, and then in a common platform to link this to the species and then to the sites and the habitats. Of course, the data users are an, uh, an important aspect, focusing here on policy at the national and European levels, especially looking for um, what are their specific needs for assessment. Um, and then based on these needs to identify which algorithms are necessary within the data warehouse to analyze and visualize the data, and then ultimately in future steps to provide assessment tools through the data warehouse for these needs. Now this consortium was begun, oh, I forgot to say this began about a year and a half ago. So most of our time has been spent working during the pandemic. 
uh, but it was mostly begun by soil and vertebrate zoologists. And at the very beginning, um, we were approached by very many mic soil microbiologists who were interested in joining and uploading their data. This is more difficult because much microbial data is collected through molecular methods. So it is a challenge to connect uh, sequences to OTUs and then to the taxa, which then can ultimately be connected to the sites and the habitats as in all other data. That is an overview of the consortium and the different working groups, of course, not in any detail. The database is already available. Of course, data can be queried and the data tables can be downloaded. Uh, the consortium is fairly young, but there are already some internal procedures for querying and visualizing data. So first steps in the direction of analysis tools. Any database must, worth its salt must be able to map data, of course the data points that are available. But these can be differentiated, um, for instance, here according to species, two closely related militant species that are showing obvious um, phylogeographical, in other words, evolutionary distribution patterns. These mappings can be also differentiated according to habitats or to um, soil parameters, et cetera. Um, tables, as I mentioned, can be downloaded as I mentioned at the very beginning, what's important are reference values. Here, just a quick and dirty analysis of Columbula and the central German uplands, um, where we can look at the average um, densities through in different habitat types in this specific area. Of course, these habitat types are, are the, 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 these reference values um, are only as good as the uh, uh, the database, which can also be um, looked at and analyzed, this, uh, this will become better and better the more data we collect. Mr. Russell, sorry for interrupting you. One more minute. Okay, I actually only have two or three more slides. Um, or looking at individual taxa, for instance, here, um, their occurrence and habitat types, an example here of a woodland species, or looking at occurrences or uh, densities in different um, soil parameters. An example, one of the rare examples of a very narrow um, niche distribution or uh, standard niche space habitat plots. Here are two related species with niche overlap, but showing um, uh, niche partitioning. Or here based on going back to reference values, looking here at um, specific habitat uh, conditions, using the database to predict what are the probable species occurrence. I say these are just initial steps and this is what I can show you in briefly. Visit us at um, the consortium, anyone is free to join or the second link here is the database itself. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, it was such, a, such an important and, and interesting initiative. As I nice to see that there is some data already online. So I would like to go to the next speaker. Uh, the fourth presentation of the day, uh, the title is the Italian Kill Network of Soil Biological Quality Assessed by Microarthropods, Arthropods Community. Uh, Mr. Lorenzo Davino uh, from Crea, Hello. Italy. Good Please afternoon. go ahead. You hear me? Yes. Uh, good afternoon or good morning or good evening, uh, depending on where, we, where you are. And uh, first of all, thanks uh, of the organizer for this wonderful opportunity to, to be part of this global symposium. I'm Lorenzo Davino. I'm a researcher of CREA. Uh, that is, uh, um, I'm sorry, is. <laughs> uh, mm, and um, that, uh, that is the, the leading Italian research organization on agri-food that I'm here uh, to, I shyly represent a working group of 59 researcher experts on microarthropod ecology that constitute uh, the, the QBSR working group hosted by Italian Society of Soil Science. Uh, this talk could be interesting uh, to describe our experience uh, in biodiversity and network and to, to, to copy the pattern. And, uh, or if you are interested in microarthropod community to, to, to join us. 
Um, I am not time to, to, to talk about, uh, to describe the, the, the index, the QBSR index, but uh, just uh, some uh, um, basic uh, principle underlying. The, the, the core principle is the, uh, the statement of the, the higher soil, the higher soil quality, the higher will be the number of microarthropod groups well adapted to, to, to soil life. Uh, to soil habitats. Um, soil quality here stands for uh, good stability and high organic matter content, uh, AI biodiversity level. Uh, obviously, QBS R is not comprehensive of the whole soil quality of the whole uh, soil biodiversity. Anyway, uh, the, the, the functional soil level adaptation of microarthropods are uh, the reduction or loss uh, of pigmentation, uh, appendage uh, reduction like short or small uh, uh, antenna legs or furca, uh, miniaturization, the, the, the streamlined uh, body form, and reduction of uh, visual structure. You see, of um, anophthalmia or microphthalmia and all biological forms are, are divided into three groups, apigeus form, amyodaphic forms or aeodaphic form. Some, uh, some group uh, are typically epigeic like disanoptera or dernaptera or psychoptera, uh, or uh, other are uh, aeodaphic like uh, diplura, protura uh, and so on. Uh, some other, like Colembola or Coleoptera, have different uh, um, soil adaptation level, uh, depending to the, the ecomorphological uh, characteristics. So, uh, as a result of this adaptation, aeodaphic microarthropods micro are um, um, typical, um, are not uh, able to uh, to move, to survive in uh, if uh, there is a soil degradation, if uh, for in polluted or com compacted or degraded soil, that is the principle. So our our network, our aim is to guarantee the correct uh, QBSR use uh, uh, to allow comparison between data to create a synergy, to develop uh, programs and projects, uh, to get a data set. We have a database uh, of uh, publication. Uh, and uh, very important to develop a standardized protocol uh, for sampling, for uh, extraction, and for uh, identification and elaboration, and uh, to promote uh, courses for beginner or in test for experts. And last but not least, uh, to help users to solve uh, troubleshooting during ident identification. We have, uh, uh, um, we catalog uh, 230 um, image, stereoscope image with uh, to assigning the correct uh, ecomorphological index in uh, value. Nowadays, we are, we are uh, 59. Expert uh, mainly in Italy from 50 region, mainly academic researcher, uh, but not only because uh, we are, um, it's, it, there, there is a um, lot of interest from uh, uh, policymaker for monitoring uh, and for uh, private body to for certification such as uh, Biodiversity Alliance, for example. Um, we are um, organizing uh, uh, in, um, in a core team of four coordinator, the first uh, four uh, author of this presentation, um, representative of the national body just referred to. Uh, and moreover, the group is uh, st structured in eight subgroups, uh, a coordinator and um, and a deputy coordinator is uh, um, defined for, for, uh, for each subgroup. And every member can uh, participate to, uh, to one to three subgroups depending on uh, his skills and, and his preference too. 
uh, without uh, any fund, we organized uh, until now nine, uh, until now five um, workshop. The fourth one was uh, in on the World Soil Day um, in the, in the context of World Soil Day and. Um, was fo followed by a public seminar and um, to disseminate our our result until now. Uh, one one uh, result is to a database with uh, 100 publication uh, and um, two uh, more than 2,600 uh, uh, sites quoted in this publication and. Uh, is uh, including including great literature in, also uh, the analysis of the extant uh, publication shows a sharp uh, increase in number and quality of publication in this 20 years uh, and uh, a meta analysis show the 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 high, the highest uh, average qbs uh, value resulted in orchards in grasslands and forests the lower value uh, occurring in urban parks and soil involving in human degradation. And uh, the average value is about 100, uh, in, in the threshold. Uh, and uh, we perform also a, a, a SWOT analysis. And uh, in conclusion, uh, QBSR index is an easy to learn and cheap tool to describe soil quality and soil biodiversity. Uh, and um, it, uh, it responds more quickly than direct measure of soil organic carbon to soil management change. That is, could be interesting, for example, in organic uh, uh, agriculture conversion. Uh, in conclusion, more, more, more trivially, we organized a public tender to have uh, a logo. Uh, we receive uh, uh, several tens of proposal, and the winning logo uh, represents a uh, stylized or rebutted mite. So uh, ob obviously, it goes down to the, the to the soil, into the soil, and we we turn up uh, with seven contributions to the to this sym symposium. So follow our mite in uh, in uh, in other in other poster or presentation. And um, I, well, with that, I, I finished my presentation. I remember that it's very, uh, we are interested to, uh, to collaborate interna at the international level uh, and to be a member is, uh, uh, you can send a, a mail to, uh, to this address and, uh, um, with, with your brief uh, presentation of your skills in microarthropods um, community. I would like to thank uh, the Professor Paolo Adamo, the past president, uh, that we had to start this adventure. And a uh, special thanks to Vittorio Parisi, uh, my professor uh, 20 years ago. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Dr. Avino. Now you reach the end of the first part of the parallel session three today. I see some questions in the chat, then I, I, I would like to pass them to, to the presenters. I would like to start with Gil. And Serena is asking, amazing work, how implementable and affordable could be monitoring on a, on a larger scale, uh, for example, global? Yeah. I mean, you asked me? No, no I'm asking to Miss Imber. Ah, okay. <laughs> For the first presentation. Yeah, you have to, okay. Okay, uh, can you tell me again the, tell me again the question, please? I don't find it in the chat. How implementable and affordable could be the monitoring on larger scale? Because you are working at national scale, you are trying to put soil biodiversity in a national uh, soil monitoring system. How, how, how upscalable the, the approach? 
uh, how is uh, it's a good question, but it's what we want to do actually. We want to see if it is uh, feasible. Um, for the moment, uh, we the strategy that we use is to uh, test on uh, thirty sites if it is feasible. Um, thirty sites uh, uh, belonging to the RMQS that are quite different in um, in difficulty to to sample from the most uh, Easy one, but is in a page in faster uh, near a, a road like this. You can put your your car just near the, the sampling area to a very difficult one that is in the mountain. You have to do a little work to go there. So that is our strategy to upscale. We we start with just uh, thirty sites, and um, after. Uh, According to the to the results with this first site that are very different, we will upscale to uh, to uh, all the, the French territory. Yeah. Other two questions that I, I see that they're important. Is remote sensing an option for monitoring soil biodiversity? And Jacinta is asking. Uh, uh, remote sensing, uh, I don't know really, but what, what I can add to this is that we are also testing the, the environmental uh, DNA uh, in, this, uh, in, in this test. It's like, uh, uh, it's not really the RMQS biodiversity, but it's in addition, in addition of the addition. And so like this, we, it's, um, we are, we are testing this methodology and to and we will compare at the end uh, the results with uh, the classical taxonomy and we with the eDNA um, species that, uh, of, uh, species that we will find with the, the eDNA so perhaps it's like uh, the first uh, first step in this type of, uh, of um, sampling yeah another small question if you if you could answer very quick. The grid size is 16 to 16 kilometers. It's coming from Adolf Malachi. Mm. Uh, we know that uh, microorganisms can differ significantly within a few centimeters. In your monitoring, how do you feel the variation within the space? Yes, this is a complicated question. Uh, actually, perhaps we have to see the, the goal of this, uh, of this study is to map the the microorganism, for example. So we we saw uh, we yes there is a big heterogeneity uh, at a very fine scale, but actually with the sixteen plus sixteen kilometer we are able, able to do um, to do a map at the country level, and if you want to get um, keep more information you can look at the atlas of the soil bacteria in France. But it's already done with uh, data from the RMQS, and uh, that already um, uh, tests this possibility. Okay, there are other, I, I think, two or three questions. They're more about the budget and the cost, but you can you can answer these questions in chat. But I would like yeah. to, yeah. Uh, there's another question. Three questions actually. Of uh, three questions, you may you may look at the chat and you will see. Uh, in those questions, uh, those questions in the gym. Um, there's a question to David Russell. Mr. Russell, uh, Rick is asking, do you do any spatial analysis using machine learning or geostatistics or just uh, point there? Um, yeah, I mentioned this in the chat and the answer was not yet with the focus on yet. So the idea of course, what we can do implement right now are just basic descriptions of the data, but we are working in other projects to include more detailed analysis, including food web analysis, distribution um, uh, modeling and uh, the question is, you know, exactly which algorithms which, would be, which we would use. Of course, this is all heavily GIS based and it will remain to be seen how much um, geostatistics we will use with this. Like I say, this is on the agenda, but 
in the future, first we collect the data and then set up the structures to use the data. And then we start implementing such modeling. But thank okay. you for the ideas and the question. It is important. Uh, I don't see any other questions. Uh, then I would like to go to the second part of this parallel session. I would like to invite uh, Mr. Eduardo Carvajo de Silva Neto. The floor uh, is he's from Soil Department, Federal Rural University of Rio de Janeiro from Brazil. The title here is How the Biological Activity of Oligo, Oligo Kita, I hope I pronounce well. Mm -hmm. Uh, shape soil aggregation and influence the soil functions. So thank you. you I will be sharing with you my screen. Please go. Can you see? Yeah. Okay, then thank you and hello and welcome to everyone to this session. Uh, I am Eduardo Neto. I'm a PhD student from the Federal Rural University of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Uh, it's really an honor to be here today with all you joining from around the world. And uh, I do want to take a moment to wish everyone all the best for good health and calm spirit during these times. Uh, well, I will be sharing with you today my research about how the biological activity of oligoqueta shape soil aggregation and influence the soil functions. So the importance of soil organisms is recognizing many processes and functions in soils. It regulates the organic matter accumulation, affects the biochemical weathering, and promotes soil rise on mixing and nutrient cycling. Soil structure is also enhanced by activity of organisms. For example, um, the invertebrates are uh, are the, in the root system of the plants, increase soil aggregation, which is responsible for the structural soil porosity and also enhances the organism's activities. Uh, in the hierarchical aggregate model, the aggregates are sequentially, the soil aggregates are sequentially formed. Uh, micro aggregates are first formed free, then uh, serving as building blocks for the formation of macro aggregates which constitutes the physicogenic formation pathway of soil aggregates. On the other hand, we have the biogenic formation pathways that contributes how biological activity on soil directly promotes the aggregate formation by activity um, earthworms, uh, macrofauna in general, and plant roots. So several studies clearly indicate that formation of Biogenic formation pathway describes how biological um, uh, activity contributes to a uh, formation of soil aggregates. Uh, but few studies in, in general investigate the biogenic formation pathway, how it works, how processes are involved. And, and we know that biogenic aggregation intensify soil structure and chemical improvement and also was sensitive to changes in land use. So this study aimed to investigate the effects of biological activity on the formation of soil aggregates using incubated soil material, considering the influence of roots and uh, the activity of macrofauna, in this case, earthworms, um, we call, uh, hypothesized that the biological activity contributes significantly to soil structure and soil quality. And then that analysis of soil aggregate types, identification and quantification, according to the origin, may be applied in establishing a biological soil quality indicator. So how it works. Um, the experiment consisted of a 12 week laboratory soil incubation with macrofauna, oligoqueta, and grass vegetation, uh, brachiata decumbis. Uh, soil samples were collected from a surface layer of an insect soil. Here in the table one, we have the physical and chemical characteristics of soil material. Uh, samples were air dry, ground and sieve over two millimeters sieve. The soil material was positioned inside plastic tubes. Um, in a number of 36 earthworms uh, 
was uh, additioned to the each, each cylinder and plus eight grams of brachiata decumbens seeds. After the incubation period, the soil, the soil aggregates formed were separated manually according to the morphological fractions using a, a stereo microscope. In the separate aggregates, we analyze the aggregate uh, stability by indices, uh, chemical and, chem and physical soil characteristics, and also biological properties. Uh, we have the we also use uh, X-ray computed microtomography to measure distribution of pore size. Um, in the results, uh, we have the percentage here of aggregates, the formation aggregates, and the biogenic formation soil uh, represent a uh, on average of 32% of soil aggregate mass. This show a relevant contribution of soil macrofauna, oligoqueta, and plant roots in the aggregate formation. Also, the biogenic aggregates show the highest values of stability, whereas the physicogenic aggregates were the less stable. Earthworms move soil particles, ingesting them and forming the biogenic aggregates uh, they are commonly termed as ecosystem engineers. And plant roots also move soil particles, um, come to close, it contact to it, each other. And all these different factors are responsible for binding together the small subunities and giving the higher stability of the biogenic aggregates as we observe in our results. Uh, the porosity evaluation of using, using uh, X-ray computed microtomography showed the higher proportion of macropores in the biogenic than the physicogenic aggregates. After passing through the earthworm gut, the soil ingested uh, is spelled in the shape of pellets, and the most aggre aggre uh, biogenic aggregates are formed by joining these unities, the subunities, and does create an extensive system of large pores, as we can observe it here in the X-ray microtomography. Uh, and uh, this explains the largest amount of micropores observing the X-ray microtomography. And here we have the results of chemical attributes of soil aggregates. The biogenic aggregates also presented the highest values of basic cations, sum of bases, cation exchange capacity, base saturation, phosphorus, and total organic carbon. The higher nutrient contents in the biogenic aggregates can be associated with their process of formation. Earthworms accelerate the decomposition of organic materials by increasing the availability of the available surface area. Uh, of organic matter through comminution. Uh, when soil organic materials pass through the earthworm guts, they are grounded up physically as well attacked chemically by digestive enzymes of earthworms and uh, the microorganism inside the gut. After digestion, some organic compounds are released into the environment in the form of small organic compounds or may or also in mineral nutrients. And finally, we have the biological properties. The higher values of microbiomass bi carbon, nitrogen, and microbial quotient found in the biogenic aggregates are associated to the composition of organic matter by earthworms and their effect of nutrient cycling. Soil structure created the habitat for a myriad of soil organisms, consequently driving the diversity and regulating the activity. Also, the organic matter uh, complexity inside the micro microaggregates becomes inaccessible to the microorganisms and thus physically more protected from losses. So, uh, as conclusion of this work, Biological activity indubitably contributes significantly to soil structure, quality, and soil functions. Where the biogenic aggregates are more stable, 
have high nutrients and organic matter contents, and thus improving uh, soil biological properties. And uh, the morphological classification of soil aggregates can be a good indicator of soil quality, size it in capacity, biological, physical, and chemical properties. It is a practical, uh, repeatable, and uh, easily understand to uh, and may be used to evaluate if soil conditions are changing according to the adoptions of sustainable soil management practices. Here I have my acknowledgements and thank you for your attention. Obrigado. Thank you, Mr. Da Silva Neto, for the presentation. Um, we will we will receive we, we can uh, we can still receive questions on the chat. I will pass them to you in the in the after the end of the session. So the second presentation of the second part has tied cultural ecosystem services of soil biota and possibilities of their use. And I would like to invite Ms. Yurga Motia Unite, I hope I pronounce it well, from Nature Research Center, Lithuania. Yes, thank you very much. Do you hear me? Yes. And I'm trying to share the... Ah, yes. I think you, you can see my... You can see that. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much. And if I try, yes. Oh. So good afternoon and whatever other time it is for everybody. I would like to uh, present you slightly different aspect of uh, soil biodiversity. So to begin with, uh, the idea of ecosystem services was originally coined to quantify the benefits that, culture, that natural ecosystems generate for human society, aiming to raise the public awareness for the value of biodiversity and conservation of ecosystems. Cultural ecosystems uh, stand out among other services in their intangibility and their non-use uh, uh, values uh, for most, but they are recognized as one of the strongest arguments for ecosystem conservation. Until recently, uh, cultural ecosystem services provided by souls were understood in a rather vague way, mostly as secondary derived from another services, uh, which is indeed very strange, having in mind that about 25% of uh, earth biodiversity live in the soil. And besides, there are many hints about cultural importance of soil, including such iconic cultural symbol as a handful of dirt. So uh, our team undertook to uh, identify the cultural ecosystem services uh, of soil biota and to highlight uh, the importance of below ground diversity for human culture and well-being. For the sheer amount of work, we limited only to uh, the soils of European forests. So we selected 11 types of cultural ecosystem services and six groups of below ground biota and created a system of keywords in 13 European languages and conducted uh, a literature research of uh, web of knowledge, uh, Google Scholar, supplementing it with uh, uh, snowball search and expert suggestions. The latter three were especially important because it is well known fact that uh, 
data on the benefits uh, from biodiversity to the, cult uh, to the cultural ecosystem, to the cultural services, uh, are mainly found in gray literature. And what did you found? We found that soil core organisms contributed to all CS, although their weight was different for individual CS and individual organism groups. Uh, strongest impact was found for cultural diversity, which means language, uh, folk, tradition, uh, other national heritage, or etc. And the lowest was found for aesthetic values, and uh, even that was largely negative. If of the organism groups, uh, the most important uh, were found to be fungi, and the least important was found microorganisms and mesofauna. This might seem very strange having in mind that microorganisms and mesofauna are indeed probably the, uh, the well, maybe the, not the most important, but very important in ecosystem, ecosystem functions and uh, other eco ecosystem services. So why these uh, cultural divisions? Uh, this is because uh, uh, of the fact that most of the CS are based on folk perception of nature. That is on salience of uh, organisms such as economical salience, meaning direct use, when well, directly used organisms are recognized better. Uh, morphological behavioral salience, uh, that means that uh, organisms with outstanding features also are recognized better. Ecological geographical salience, uh, species that are more common and are present in the area in question are also better recognized. And last though not the least is size salience of different taxa, uh, which means that larger, uh, larger species are culturally more important. Meanwhile, microorganisms are invisible and therefore non-existent. In... And in any case, our review has shown that soil biota is an important supplier of cultural ecosystem services. And this, and which is even more important, these services are less controversial than those based on landscape values because they automatically exclude uh, any human creations. However, CS uh, derived from soil biota are generally not well understood, both by researchers and general public. Uh, and this stems from uh, different values and understanding by beneficiaries, because beneficiaries may understand, understand uh, uh, cultural services uh, depending on their social position, on their national tradition, and uh, similar social phenomena. Another thing is temporal and spatial fluctuations of CS and their regionality. That means that uh, CS uh, based on organisms, uh, their importance differ in time. They, they may strengthen or weaken. And they are not universal. They may, certain, certain CS may be important in one region, region, but have no importance in another. So they are not universal. And the last thing, which, is, is special, which especially pertains CS from soil, 
people generally do not associate PCS with soil, even when organisms is directly comes from soil or is associated with soil. You, are, you have one more minute. Yes, I'm about. Uh, so what should we do? Should we should use we should use uh, this knowledge to create new and expand existing educational mate uh, materials, make them attractive for all all age levels, not only children, and promote and support citizen science in soil biodiversity recording. Uh, or any other activities connected to soil biota. Some examples were very nicely shown here on this, in this conference. And there are some obstacles to overcome. That is, we should show how important and interesting uh, micro world of the soil is. This includes general public. We should overcome aesthetic values because most of general public do not see uh, soil organisms as, as, as aesthetically pleasing and overcome regional differences, for example, such as mycophobia and mycophily among different uh, nations. So this is it. I would like to thank uh, my co-authors and cost action which enabled this research and to remind it was said on the first day of the conference that soil biodiversity is an unsung hero. This is not exactly true. It is just that the songs are forgotten or sung in different languages. We just need to remember them. Thank you. Thank you, Yuga. It was an interesting, interesting presentation. So the next presenter is um, Ms. Serena Kauchi from United Nations University. She'll be talking about soil biodiversity, teams with life, but faces pollution. Are we acting correctly in the agroecosystems? Kauchi. Is Miss Couch here? Yeah, she's here. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Okay. Can you see yes, also my Please screen? Please go ahead. Okay. So um, I have everyone. So I hope you can correctly see the screen going on. I hope so. Yes. Um, great. Um, I would like to pick up from some of uh, the talks which have been uh, given in the previous uh, session, uh, especially from Mr. Di Matteo and from my colleagues from uh, INRA and the Coast Action for EU DAFO base uh, on soil biodiversity. I think that there were many aspects that you might see back uh, in my presentation as well. So I do need to uh, say anything about soil biodiversity and the relevance of soil biodiversity because many honorable speakers have been uh, debating on it and giving way more uh, interesting presentation than mine. But we all know that soil biodiversity is fundamental for our life and per se on ecosystems and its uh, services here on the earth. Um, unfortunately, biodiversity loss has uh, been a fact in uh, pre previous years and way more in the uh, modern days. And uh, soil biodiversity suffer especially from human activities and human induced global changes. Some of those driving factors are allocated from uh, human induced change like uh, global warming, carbon, carbon dioxide, alter precipitation of atmospheric nitrogen deposition, but as well on the use that we do of our soil and this refer especially to land use chains where the decline in terrestrial ecosystem has been um, defined one of the biggest challenges of our uh, days. As well, urbanization and increased growth uh, population have uh, intensified the agriculture intensification and such an ex extensive use of agrochemicals and also uh, 
uh, practice, intensive practice, have been degrading our soils. So um, how uh, the input of, I would like to focus especially on the input on how agriculture exact pressure on our soil biodiversity. And this can be of different uh, type. One can be on the chemical, can be mechanical, can be also by inserting uh, plastic po uh, pollutants or plastic residues like mulching from uh, uh, agricultural practices or greenhouse cultivation, as well as uh, treating uh, the soils or um, irrigating soil with poorly treated wastewater for irrigation. Um, so soil biodiversity at the same time can also be not uh, negatively uh, affected by uh, agricultural practices, but also can be pushed by good practice agriculture like intercropping, like on-farm composting, the use of microbial inoculants as a biofertilizer or no-till farming for ecosystem-based agriculture. So not all that is uh, human-based is uh, defined as a negative effect in solid biodiversity. Um, I would like to stress a bit in this talk uh, on the understanding that we have on soil biodiversity. And as said from our colleague from the previous talk, uh, biodiversity is not always understood in this holistic uh, perception, but it's rather defined onto silos and it works more on, uh, especially in research on identification of uh, interaction within a certain biota group and not always the interaction between different microbiotas uh, has been highlighted. So that was a pleasure to see that our colleague from ERA has uh, specified with his national wide monitoring uh, the RMQS that there are action uh, ongoing that aim at a more uh, holistic uh, understanding. Um, in this uh, talk, I also would like to define how biodiversity research then is currently uh, addressed. I already spoiled that it's rather on working on silos, but I will give you some more detail afterwards. And also our representative is uh, the holistic, bio, our, our bio, uh, holistic biodiversity studies compared to the one focusing on individual group of biodiversity. Um, um, as uh, similarly as our colleague uh, in the very first session today at two, uh, we perform a network analysis, but here I would like just to show you the results on increased publication from the late 1990s up to nowadays has been increased for soil agriculture and pollution loss. Uh, as well as for the global biodiversity, the uh, uh, articles have been sensibly increasing, but uh, not always this uh, biodiversity has been understood as biodiversity global, but rather to sectorial biodiversity. You can clearly see that most of the studies here on the left, when we define uh, agri uh, biodiversity loss in agriculture due to pollution here on the left-hand side, most of almost half of the studies were addressing only a certain phyla, so either bacteria or uh, fungi or earthworms. And the same is true then for uh, biodiversity loss when we look at bioremediation strategies. So the, despite the theoretical complexity and the known complexity of soil uh, is known, it, this is not represented into scientific uh, research. And therefore we think that more studies to be, uh, should be addressed over it. When we look at the distribution in terms of which are the, pollutants that are uh, affecting actually biodiversity loss. You can see on the right hand side of your screen, uh, most of the um, relation of biodiversity loss has been given to pesticides and uh, also due partially to climate change, but also to uh, farming, intensive farming activities. And studies has been mostly conducted here in uh, Europe and the larger, larger part also in Asia. All the other area re still remain in terms of uh, biodiversity loss not well uh, known. 
um, when we look at how can, what can we do uh, to preserve or enhance our soil biodiversity, as we see that biodiversity loss is a serious threat, we should look, of course, what uh, we nicely have heard before to uh, prevent agriculture, uh, so soil loss and protect microbial biodiversity from the uh, um, reduction in uh, diversity and quantity, but as well to preserve soil from degradation and co coordination. How we can do that, of course, we need to do not only sustainable practices, but we also apply for monitoring of uh, soil biodiversity that should be supporting and uh, coordinated also with soil organic matter levels and also at the national level and regulatory frame for pesticides use. And from our side, from the academia, of course, we have to increase our know-how and our uh, efforts towards the more holistic understanding of interaction from different biota interaction. Um, this is the long term, right? So when we want to look at what can we do, I mean, this section is like in, uh, biodiversity on action. How can we buffer uh, biodiversity loss in agriculture uh, soils? Um, we had experimental evidences together with colleagues here in Italy with the CCS Aosta that um, soil loss can be mitigated by using uh, symbiotic microorganisms applied to soil. And this is the goal on the long term will be also to increase in microbial vitality at the rhizosphere level and also on soil biodiversity. So, um, this type of uh, application or sustainable application in uh, agriculture is called symbiotic agriculture and is an agricultural technique that is used for soil system functioning and agrosystem services. What is that? It's nothing else than um, cultivating in laboratory and reproducing culturable soil micro microbial bacteria and, and also uh, mycorrhiza and uh, actinomycetes into a um, bioconditioner that can be used and applied to soil when it comes to the seeding uh, time. Uh, what is the benefit for that is that the, the soil can maintain microbial biodiversity and community dynamics can also arbor microorganisms with the ability to decrease and metabolize xenobiotics, so preserve also soil and plants from uh, pollution or at least reduce the impact, but can also uh, enrich roots from nutrient stabilization and mobilization, and as well uh, can uh, buffer uh, abiotic stress uh, with for plants. Ms. Cauchy, last one yes. minute. Yes, yep, there we go. Um, with, so therefore, um, the benefits are many, and I would say that this type of uh, agriculture-based or sustainable practice can have a further um, exploring, can explore further uh, the, uh, its application at the moment has been applied to different type of crops, but also it has shown a lot of positive impact on soil uh, resilience and also in uh, alleviating uh, phytotoxicity into plants as well as enabling uh, co control of plant pathogen into the uh, into the soil for uh, plants so towards plants so i would say that this is a potential um, a potential benefit uh, for uh, making into action soil biodiversity. And with that, maybe I would like to conclude and leave maybe if you have any further question to this uh, talk to reach me out through the chat. And to all of you, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Cauchy. So we are the um, our last presentation of the day is use of Biochar lupinus, uh, Brady rhizobium, as an alternative to improve the vegetation cover of high Andean soils contam contaminated by heavy metals. I would like to invite this Natalie Taco Tape, Taipe, uh, from National Agrarian University Molina, from Peru. Yes, good morning. Thank Please you for, <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. Um...
Okay. Uh, thanks a lot for this opportunity to present uh, my my investigation. Um, uh, well, um, I am Natalie Taco. I am work in laboratory <coughs> of um, Ecología Microbiana y Biotecnología of um, Universidad Nacional Agraria La Molina University. Uh, uh, I am going to present uh, uh, the, about the use of biochar lupinus bradyrhizobium as an alternative to improve the vegetation cover of high Andean soils uh, contaminated by heavy metals. Uh, okay, we know that uh, heavy metal contamination uh, in soils is a global problem. Uh, in my country, in Peru, uh, these uh, have two sources, third natural and the other is industry. And naturally, because, uh, because um, geodynamic uh, process of the Andean mountains, it causes um, mineralized cities. And in the other hand, uh, industry, uh, because of um, a lot of anthropic and activities, uh, and mainly uh, meaning. It causes um, contaminated cities. It's a real problem uh, in my country. Uh, also, um, so uh, in this, um, uh, in this, uh, problem uh, we need to alternative to re start restoring uh, cities especially natural cities uh, so we have um, several biological remediation techniques but um, one is a phyto remediation um, uh, I am um, in the laboratory. Uh, we are starting work uh, with a fit phytostabilization plants because uh, it is a process that reduces the mobility of the pollutant, the pollutants in in a field. Uh, so we have some tools. Uh, first, we know uh, the lupinus is a species with good characteristics uh, for phytostabilization of pollutants. Also, we have a lot of species of this uh, of lupinus. Uh, in the other hand, we have the uh, rice um, husk biochar because it is. Um, um, it reduces the metal availability. Uh, also, uh, it works like um, as a carrier of mi microorganisms. In addition to the soil, it can increase the population of rhizobium. Um, the lupinus and lupinus genus, uh, like a lot of fabaceous, uh, don't work. Doesn't work alone. It have it works uh, with uh, symbiotic bacteria, specifically for lupinus is bradyrhizobium. Uh, so we have three factors. First, biochar. In this case, rice husk biochar. Uh, then lupinus, this uh, surf. Also, we have um, the bradyrhizobium. Two strains, in this case, we work uh, of, uh, with two strains of brother resovium. The first, uh, what L, L6, and the other, the L4. Uh, so the objective uh, of this research was to observe what the effect of bio, biochar uh, and the inoculation of symbiotic strain of brother resovium and the interaction of both on the growth of lupinus mutabilis in substrate of heavy metals contaminated soils and in greenhouse conditions. We have seven treatments. Uh, three of them uh, have contained um, biochar. Uh, and uh, we have a treatment uh, only with agricultural soil without um, 
contamination soils. In each treatment, have uh, we have three uh, pots, and in each pot, um, three plants. Um, first, uh, we have to collect uh, soil, uh, altered soil uh, from the from the field, and transport them uh, it to the greenhouse. Then we prepare the pots. Uh, in the treatments with biochar, we replace the um, the soil, the contaminated, uh, the altered soil, 15% uh, of, of their volume with biochar. Uh, when we add the biochar, um, better is better a little uh, of the pH. Uh, is better, right? Uh, also, the condition or the characteristic of soils was in altered soils is was very bad. When we can see pH very acid, also don't have uh, or, or it doesn't have um, organic material. Uh, and we work with uh, lupinus seeds. In this case, uh, the cultivated lupinus is um, lupinus mutabilis. Okay, we disinfected these uh, seeds. Uh, then um, we um, uh, we prepare the inoculant of those two strains, uh, six and eight. Uh, also, um, the inoculation was at the snowing and uh, 15 days days later this is the um, the picture with 6 day, day later uh, the same the seeds uh, the germination of lupinus mutabilis um, yeah, the results uh, was um, we separate in two groups first the plants with biochar and in the other group without biochar. In, in each one, we have the control, the pots of inoculant of one kind, or what uh, the strain six, in this case, the, the strain um, eight, and this pot is uh, the agriculture soil. Okay, and in this case, for example, the, this inoculant um, treatments is better in aerial length. Um, in contrast, the control in this case uh, is the same. The, the inoculant have um, better results, um, but uh, apparently I don't have um, the difference in uh, uh, in this group and the other group, but uh, when we examine the root, uh, we uh, see some difference. For example, uh, the treatments that have biochar um, had a more um, fresh root weight was better. Also, we can see uh, more nodules like that. In this case, uh, uh, the root uh, with um, biochar, biochar pots, for example, in other than the nodules was very small, was very small. And uh, um, there are more differences. And the other difference is the cover of, uh, of leaf is, is better in treatments with biochar. And uh, also in the, the concentration the, of metals in root and in the in the aerial was, um, um, for example, it is important to see in treatments with strains and biochar more was uh, more, more more concentration in root in consequently less concentration in the higher plants. It's uh, is similar for metals, lead, chrom, and iron. And uh, finally, I, I to conclude, the treatments with and without biochar and inoculated with uh, brother resovium showed a significantly great growth of aerial and root part of plants. 
that their respective controls, the treatment that were inoculated and with biochar allowed significantly higher concentration of lead, chromium and iron in root plants and the lower concentration of this metal in IRA plants. And then next, um, maybe now it's work, uh, recommended to test the, these, uh, these experiments in felt condition. Thank you to the Fondesit because finance, uh, for financial this work and uh, Castañeda engineer for providing us the rice husk and biochar. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Taco. So now it was the last presentation of this parallel session. I would like to open the floor, questions, remarks. Now we have about like 15 minutes. I see a few questions uh, in the chat. You can still ask in the chat. You can uh, raise your hand, uh, using the button just under the actions, raise, raise hand and uh, we can give you the floor, then you can ask uh, your question to, to the participants. So I see uh, some questions. Uh, the first one is for Eduardo uh, from Vanessa. Vanessa is asking, which species did you add to the uh, mycos? Uh, um, we collect the soil material from the a horizon of an inceptive soil. And after the collection, the soil was air dried and sieve, and then we added the earthworms. The species of earthworm is Pontolexus coretrus. It's a very common species in here in Brazil. And in addition, we uh, they added the seeds of the grass and also a very common grass in Brazil, which is Brachiaria de Cumbins. Uh, these are where the species that we added the soil material that we collected. Okay, there's another question uh, for Eduardo. It's from Julio. Which methodology of stability of aggregates correlated best with the biogenic stability of, of, of aggregates? And there are, there are several dry sieving, uh, different solutions, et cetera. We use the which uh, utilize uh, the Yoder method is a wet sieving procedure. Uh, briefly, a nest of six sieves are placed in a holder and suspended in a container of water. So aggregators uh, was placed in the top of sieve in of each and f the next in in the nest of lowered and the pointed where the soil samples are top screen. A motor of mechanical arrangement and uh, lower the, and raise the necks of sieves in the amount of soil aggregates retaining in each sieve were determined by drying and weighting. The aggregate stability in indices we utilize is mean, uh, mean wage diameter and geometric mean diameter. Okay, I see. Other questions? I see many compliments to, to the presenters uh, because they were, they were perfect, perfect presentations. They were very useful and interesting. I see another question was already answered. I think it was to Dr. Cauchi about the pesticide pollution. But I see in the chat that it was already, already answered. So the floor is open. You can raise your hand if you have any any other questions or even remarks about the session or about the, the, the studies, the presentations that you have heard today. I see a question from Marta Lucia. Maybe this question is for a plenary session. I would like to know that what initiatives are there to implement all this knowledge? Field work with small pe uh, peasants. Uh, the, do not involve private companies. I think this, uh, this question should be addressed to the plenary tomorrow. Are there any questions? If anyone uh, wants to intervene? I don't see any other questions. 
or hands. So should I conclude the meeting? It's just uh, still have 10 minutes. Okay, so we reached the end of the session. I would like to thank all the presenters and participants also. But we will meet again tomorrow with another session. Dr. Zoe Lindo, team leader, will present the outcomes of the session tomorrow at the plenary session. There will be a short presentation, I think. And I would like to remind you that uh, the poster cons is still on, on the GSOBI website. I think it will, it will close uh, before the plenary tomorrow. You can go on the GSOBI website. Uh, you can go to the poster contest webpage. A contest is an excuse here that I want I want you to see the presentations because there are more than 50 posters, very nice posters on the page. Another thing is uh, the presentations and the recordings of this session will be available on the GSPN GSOBI website right, right after, after the symposium. And these are, these are my last words. I would like to say stay safe and healthy. See you tomorrow in the plenary session. Thank you all.